caution people on it's at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. The other lectures this week will be at 10.30. Uh, tomorrow we had a slight uh, schedule adjustment, so it's 10 a.m., okay? So we'll still be calling before you, but uh, if you come at 10.30, you're gonna miss a great half hour, so <laughs> plan early. Uh, one other piece that I want to draw your attention to, uh, your evaluation forms. No. At the end of today's lecture, if you could please remember to fill those out, and then you don't need to do anything but leave them at your seat. We will come through afterward and pick them up so you don't have to worry about finding the basket and um, figuring out where it goes to next. We'll do that part, but we do need you to fill them out because that's the piece we're going to So I'm delighted to introduce one of our students, Cynthia Weaver, who's going to come and do the introduction of today's speaker. Thank you, Cynthia. <laughs> my honor today to introduce our speaker for this year's Stanley I. Stewart Lectures. And I'd like to begin by saying a little about Dr. Stanley I. Stewart himself, an introductory introduction, if you will. <laughs> and we have a number of his family members here today, so they can add to or correct if necessary <laughs> anything I have to say. Dr. Stuber was born in 1903, and he lived until 1985. He is a 1928 graduate of Rochester Theological Seminary, one of our founding institutions. According to the American Baptist Historical Society, Dr. Stanley I. Stuber earned an international reputation as an advocate of peace, human rights, goodwill, and ecumenism. He was an, off, an official observer of a number of sessions at the UN. He edited the Daily Bulletin of the World Council of Churches in Amsterdam. He attended four sessions of the Second Vatican Council between 1962 and 1965. Served as an executive secretary of the World Relief Committee during World War II. Was actively involved in the formation of the National Council of Churches in 1950 and he chaired the Commission on Religious Liberty of the Baptist World Alliance for 15 years. Again, according to the American Baptist Historical Society, Dr. Stuber was best known for his interdenominational and international leadership, his spirit of humanitarianism, civil rights, world peace, and justice for all people, is remembered in this lectureship named in his honor. Our speaker today is Dr. Mark Graverman, the Program Director of Kairos USA, a movement to unify and mobilize American Christians, lay, academic, and clergy to take a prophetic stance for a just peace in Israel and Palestine. In his work, Dr. Graverman focuses on the role of religious beliefs and theology in the current discourse and the function of interfaith relations in the current search for a resolution of the conflict. He serves on the advisory board of Friends of Seville North America and on the board of the Israeli Committee Against House Demolitions USA. Dr. Braverman is co-founder of Friends of Tent of Nations North America, a nonprofit dedicated to supporting Palestinian land rights in historic Palestine. He consults to and writes for the Israel-Palestine Mission Network of the Presbyterian Church USA and has been appointed consultant for Evangelicals for Middle East Understanding. He is a charter member of American Jews for a Just Peace. In 2009, Dr. Braverman participated in the launch of the Kairos Palestine document in Bethlehem, delivering a panel address and meeting with lay and clergy leaders from around the world to develop a strategy for church action on a global basis. In 2011, he was the U.S. delegate to the Southern Africa-Palestine encounter in Johannesburg and presented a lecture on Cairo's theology, interfaith politics, theology, and the role of the church in bringing a just peace to Israel and Palestine. In September 2011, Dr. Braverman lectured and led workshops at the A Moment of Truth Conference of Cairo's Netherlands at the Free University of Amsterdam, 
and he presented a week-long lecture series on Kairos theology at the Iona community in Argyle, Scotland in May 2012. Last May, May 2012 I just mentioned, the CRCDS class pilgrimage to Iona, Living Spirituality, led by the Reverend Dr. Stephanie Sobey, traveled to the island of Iona, Scotland, for the week of Kairos Theology, led by Dr. Graber. I had the great good fortune of being on that trip, and I attended a number of sessions led by Dr. Graber. Perhaps the most powerful of these for me was hearing him preach in the Iona Abbey. I'd like you to take a moment to imagine the scene. 200 or more people filling the Abbey, likely mostly Christians, from around the world, speakers of many languages, receiving a sermon in a 15th century abbey in Scotland from an American Jew on the Sunday of Pentecost. <laughs> it was wonderful. Dr. Braverman preached from the lectionary, as he did this morning, using texts from Acts and Ezekiel, the stories of Pentecost and the Valley of the Dry Bones. In his sermon, Dr. Braverman spoke of Kairos moments, Moments not defined by minutes and days, but by events and opportunities that can bring irrevocable changes. He spoke of Pentecost as a story of movement from the particular to the universal, and looked at the current occupation of Palestine as just such an opportunity, as the time for, as he said, the movement away from the possession of territory and to the honoring of the entire person. As for the dry bones, Dr. Braverman offered hope that they might live by challenging both Jewish and Christian communities to let the fire of the Spirit move through them and rattle the bones to life by speaking out in the universal language of justice. With a wonderful weaving of two stories from Scripture, Dr. Braverman spoke of the hope that Christianity can continue the social justice tradition of the Torah and the Prophets. You can see why we have invited Dr. Braverman to speak at a lectureship, the namesake of which had an international reputation as an advocate of peace and human rights. It is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Braverman. Six more times. <laughs> it keeps calling you, it keeps calling you back. So, those of you who are students who have a chance to go on this trip, um, uh, you should go. It's very special. How's the sound in the back? Not well. Can you crank it up? Mm -hmm. okay. How's that in the back? Uh, I can hear it coming back to me now. Yep. Okay, so that's good. If there's a problem, if my voice drops, just please make desperate hand gestures in the back. <laughs> I'll fix it. 
Um, and I, I just want to thank you all for, for being here and um, for this wonderful institution for welcoming me um, to, uh, to Dr. McGregor in particular. I hope we get a chance to, to meet and visit just a bit. Um, and Cindy, thank you for that wonderful tribute to, to, uh, to Stanley Stuber. I um, am learning about him, and I've had a chance to meet some of the wonderful family to have lunch with you all. This is terrific to hear some stories. Uh, it seems to me that, um, and one reason that I feel particularly honored to be giving these lectures, is that Dr. Stuber really represented the kind of uh, pastor, the kind of Christian, the kind of theologian, the kind of leader that I admire and, and would like to emulate. A man who was totally committed to breaking down the walls that separate different communities, whether they be by race or geography or belief, uh, and also breaking down the walls that separate the church, the church often uses and builds to separate itself from the world that it is here to serve. It's really what I want to talk about. Yeah. You know, in a way, it's easier if I'm told that I just have, you know, an hour to cover that <laughs> material. Because then, you know, I've only, I know I've only got an hour, and I know I've got to do it in an hour. If you give me two hours, then I start to think about all the possible moving parts that can be assembled to try to cover this topic as I see it, which is constantly expanding. Um, so just to give you a sense of how I think I'm going to do this, is that I will spend uh, this first lecture uh, trying to lay out sort of general landscape and to talk about my own journey, not because I'm a terribly interesting person, but because my own particular journey as um, a Jew born in 1948 in this country who then encounters the occupation of Palestine, um, seems to bring and to focus what I feel are the, are the critical issues. Anyway, that works for me, and I get to talk about my favorite topic, which is... <laughs> uh, I also have a, I do have a clock in front of me, and so I'm going to work very hard to try to keep my remarks um, down to an hour so that there would be time for the really fun part, which would be when we get to have a conversation and then you know, continue that uh, tomorrow as well. So how to begin? Let me start with a story. I was, uh, I think Cindy mentioned this, I was in Holland, um, I guess it was almost eight, almost two years ago now, for a conference, a conference um, co-sponsored by um, Kairos, the Netherlands, and Friends of Sabil, the Netherlands. Now those are two organizations, let me briefly tell you what they are if you're not familiar with them. Sabil, I will talk about a bit later. It is, uh, the whole uh, title is the uh, Ecumenical Palestine Liberation Theology Center of Jerusalem. Something like These are Palestinian Christians, originally Anglican, but it's become fairly ecumenical, who are dedicated to uh, developing a liberation theology and uh, nonviolent resistance to occupation among Palestinian Christians, and really take a lead in Palestinian society as Christians in trying to keep their culture alive um, and, to, and to survive. Uh, Kairos, is a um, document that was most recently written in 2009 by a group of Palestinian Christian leaders. Uh, it borrowed the term from the South Africans who were documented in, 2000, in 1985. And that, of course, all goes back to the Gospels. And I think the first time it appears is in Mark chapter 1 where it's translated in various different ways, but the, the time where the season has arrived, and the word there is kairos, which is translated time because it's time not in the chronological sense, but in the time of God opening up an opportunity in history for things to change fundamentally. 
And so the arrival of Jesus was a Kairos time. So I'm at this conference, and um, the Dutch uh, had invited a delegation of Palestinians to this conference to talk about the Palestinian struggle and to talk about the kind of theology that had been developed uh, in response to occupation. And, you know, Holland is a very flat country, and so everything always needs to be very, very fair and balanced. I <laughs> <laughs> like that to a fault. And uh, so there was a panel. And this panel was a panel to discuss, thank you so much. This panel was a panel to discuss the, uh, the Palestinian, the, the Palestine Kairos document. I'll go into it in, in a bit more depth later, and maybe tomorrow we can talk about it even, in even more depth. Uh, but it basically is a, well, the whole title of it is Moment of Truth, a uh, cry from the heart, a cry of love, faith, and hope from the heart of Palestinian suffering. And that really says it all. It lays out the facts on the ground talks about what is happening. It identifies the occupation as a sin. It reaches out in love, in the sense of uh, how love is talked about in the Gospels, Christian love, to the, quote, enemy, which is uh, the Israeli occupation. And of course, love of enemy means you're doing wrong. Stop doing it. Let's live together. That's love expressed to an enemy. And then it talks about various steps that can be taken, including an endorsement of the civil society Palestinian call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions to exert pressure on Israel um, to stop its illegal activities. And so there's a panel. There's several people on this panel, but the two I remember are um, a local rabbi who's very much involved in interfaith activities and interfaith dialogue in Han. <coughs> and the top bureaucrat of the um, uh, Protestant Church of the Netherlands, which is most sort of like the state Protestant Church of the Netherlands. It's a combination of the, the old Dutch Reformed Church and the Lutheran Church. They merged the so most mainline Protestants in Holland. And he's up there as well, and several other folks. So I don't remember who got up first. I think it might have been the uh, pastor. And this, of course, this, this church guy is a, is a pastor. They, they cycle through every four years to this position in the church bureaucracy. And so he, he stands up and he holds up the Palestine document, Palestinian document, and he says, this is a fine document. The Dutch Reformed Church, the Dutch Protestant Church of the Netherlands, supports the Palestinians in their struggle for liberation and dignity and self-determination. But we cannot support this document. We cannot support this document because it calls for a boycott of Israel. We Dutch people, Dutch Christians, have been down this road before. We cannot go there. This is an action taken against an entire people. Can't do it. Okay. So I'm processing this. I'm not on this panel. I get to sit in the audience for this session. And sit here. Then the rabbi gets up. This is a fine document. <laughs> as a rabbi, as a Jew, as a Dutchman, I support the Palestinian struggle for liberation and, and dignity. They are having a tough time. Our heart goes out to them. But <laughs> cannot support this document. And what's the but for the, for, the, for the rabbi? This document only talks about the Palestinian story, the Jewish narrative is missing. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm still processing, you know, the church guy. <laughs> I've got this going on. So, as I say, I wasn't on the panel. I didn't get a chance to respond to that. I didn't get a chance to talk to either of these gentlemen, but 
the conversation's going on in my head, and it had continued to go on, and you know sometimes conversations you don't get to have, you, you, you have them in your head for a while. So here's what I would have said to, to the rabbi, first of all. I would have said, Rabbi, you're wrong. This is the Jewish story. This is the Jewish story for today. Yes, of course, we mourn and remember and honor those who, those who died and the suffering that we have experienced over the millennium at your hands. Of course we do. But that's not our story today. Our story today is the suffering that we are causing another And if and until we don't realize that, we're finished. Someday we will be on our knees in contrition for what we have done, for the crimes we have committed. It will happen. So this is the Jewish story. And the sooner that happens, the better for us. Not the, I'm not thinking about the Palestinians. They will get their freedom. They will get their liberation. It is inevitable. It happens. It will happen. And they know it. It's our people we have to be thinking about. We are the ones who really are in peril here. So that's my spiel to the rabbi. To the, uh, to the church official, I wanted to ask him a question. And the question was, and you can guess what the question is, the question was, do you really not understand the difference? between the campaign, the movement, today, the legal, nonviolent, time-tested, legitimate movement to exercise economic, political, and cultural control sanctions against the government that basically has achieved rogue government status, that is in violation of international law, and is the major impediment to peace, and is holding both peoples, the Israelis and the Palestinians, captive, and it is probably the only hope, given how the politics are going. Do you really not understand the difference between BDS, boycott, divestment, and sanctions, and the anti-Jewish laws that were enacted by the Third Reich when they first took power in Germany in the 30s? Do you really not understand the difference? Now, I understand your pain. I really do. As a European, as a Dutchman, for those years, and I understand your feelings of guilt because you didn't do that well by your Jews. But do you not understand the difference? And both of these men were completely captive to their past. <coughs> Neither of them has recovered. So this is the danger, but it's also the opportunity. I mean, this, folks, is much bigger than power. We get into this, we understand what's going on there, we unpack the theology and the politics, and we open up something that I think really holds the key to the future of our civilization and of our planet. It's that big. It's not, you know, Palestinian, we're talking about 10 million people in this little strip of land. And Palestinian suffering is not the worst suffering in the world. I mean, you can go to refugee camps in sub-Saharan Africa that make the refugee camps in Bethlehem and even in southern Lebanon and in Jordan look like Beverly Hills. That's not the issue. The issue is that you have a refugee population. You have a refugee situation that's 65 years old. Still, no recognition that these people have been hurt, that they've been robbed, and that they have the right to go home. Why? Because then what happens to the Jewish state? That's a human rights violation which is incalculably important in terms of its implications. There's no acknowledgement of what has happened. And you have, as we speak, the ongoing construction of a physical, economic, and political infrastructure being paid for by our tax dollars as we sit here, those of us who are paying taxes. 
that when South Africans go there, say, oh, this is not a market. This is worse than what we have. Mm -hmm. We're building it. We're building it now in full view of the world. Mm -hmm. So that's unprecedented. Mm -hmm. So it's much bigger than Palestine. And again, the danger is that it's going on. And how we're going to stop it, the opportunity is that more and more people are visiting and realizing what's going on, and more and more communities are getting involved. And I hope I get a chance to talk about it today, but certainly by tomorrow, what I want to be talking about is, what is it about this cause that is so gripping to people? Why is it that South Africans, who God knows have issues to deal with in their, in their own country now, are jumping in with both feet to support Palestine? What is it that African Americans are going over there now and coming back and saying, we are down with Palestine. Let's, let's, let's do something about that because it helps ground us in our own struggle here domestically. There's something magical, mysterious, and powerful that happens when you reach out to an oppressed or suffering group outside of your own context. It does not take away from your energy and your focus on what you need to deal with at home in your own community. It puts you on your prophetic feet and helps you get there faster, quicker, and more powerful. And that seems to be true. So that's one reason, another reason why Palestine is so important. And why, and this is the case that I make, it is the most urgent cause facing the American church, the United States church, today. Now that's a strong, bold statement. One reason I can make that statement is that it doesn't mean abandoning what's going on in your backyard. It means in some way that if you do not and cannot connect to people who are suffering somewhere else, then you can't be in your backyard. And it isn't that really, when you're talking about Pentecost, what's, what's the Great Commission? The Great Commission is, get the hell out of Jerusalem. Go to the ends of the earth. This is, you know, the world is my footstool. You need to be out there. Then you can come back to Jerusalem, and that's where you, you know, you start the kingdom there, but you keep going. So, for those of you who um, have not been paying attention, the peace process is not working. <laughs> it's not working because it's based on assumptions that are completely wrong. Well, lies. <laughs> And I think, I think it was Mark Twain. Is it Mark Twain who said there are lies and there are damn lies? <laughs> okay, so these are damn lies. Um, I used to have just two on this list. I'm, down, I'm up to about four. The first lie, the first assumption that the whole diplomatic peace process political theater thing has been based on is that Israel is interested and willing to have a contiguous, sovereign, independent Palestinian state on its borders. Clearly, Israel is not. Now, there may be citizens of Israel who think it's a great idea, but you know, they don't. Look who they're voting for. The government of Israel, in its policies, and this has been true forever since the state was established and it was planned before the state came into being and it was planned before Hitler when they were talking about um, transfer, isn't that a nice term? Transfer of Arabs. Back in the 30s, Green and, and, Green and his henchmen, transfer of Arabs, back in the 30s. Okay. Uh, this has been true forever in Israel. Israel is doing exactly what a Jewish state has to do. A state based on a political ideology known as Zionism is doing exactly what it has to do. It has to do something about the inconvenient and basically unacceptable reality of non-Jews <coughs> living in this territory that has now been claimed as the national homeland of the Jewish people. And when Israel 
Israel accepted the 1947 uh, uh, partition state agreement of the, of the United Nations. It did so thinking, that's fine, we'll take this, we'll get the rest later. I mean, and that's all public record. This is what they were saying. So this is what it needs to do. And the 1967 war, which we're now finding out from the generals and their sons themselves, was a preemptive war and it was an opportunistic war. And it was meant to take more territory. And it did. And they were never going to give it back. And once they had it, it was not going to be a benign occupation. It was going to be a continuation of what is a colonial settler project in the 21st century. And that's what's happened. Now, um, you can't make the Palestinians into slaves, although we may be approaching that. But they can't be full citizens either. Uh, because the Jewish state, unlike South Africa, was founded on the idea that the Jews have to be a majority. And so what you get is basically an apartheid system, which is what is now in place. It is in place. It's done. So people who talk about uh, one state and two state, and they say, well, it sounds like you don't think the two states can happen anymore because of the occupation, so you must be a one-stater. And my, what I say to that is I'm not having that conversation anymore. Mm -hmm. This is not an issue of one state or two states. And it's not up to us to decide what the ultimate political solution is going to be. It might be some sort of federated thing. It doesn't matter. I don't care. It doesn't matter what the borders are. It matters that if there are borders, it not be a wall. Yeah. It matters that if there are borders, then you have people on other, either side of those borders that are living as equals. Okay? And that's not what you're going to have. If a, quote, two-state solution were to go into into effect now, and that of course is what J Street wants, and where all the progressive Jews are saying, two states, two states, it's like a mantra, repeating it over and over again. We want two states, and guess who else? He's sitting in the White House. He's also reciting the mantra. We have one state now. It's called Israel. It's an apartheid state. Our job is not to decide whether it's going to be two states two states or one states or some sort of federated construction. Our job is to say to the current reality, which is a single apartheid state supported by our government and by the Western powers, that this is illegitimate and unacceptable. And what are we going to do about it? And that's where the church comes in. So that's damn line number one. Damn line number two is that the United States is an honest broker to this process of this negotiation between these so-called equal parties that can enter into a negotiation. Now there's a sub-why in there, which is that you can have a negotiation between an occupier and an occupied, between a superpower and a subject demil you know, demilitarized population. Of course you can't. The United States plays along with that myth and says it's an honest broker. Well, of course it is not. The United States has been best described as Israel's banker and Israel's lawyer, and that's who we've been. Now, I think that Barack Obama is done with that. I mean, I think his last trip was basically a farewell. You guys are on your own now. You're not going to be a broker anymore. Well, we will continue to be your banker, but we may not be your lawyer. You're on your own. We'll just keep feeding you the money. But that's a myth as well. And so the whole process of negotiation, quote, negotiations, all of that political theater can't work because the assumptions that uh, underlay that, that, that whole uh, project have been shown to be completely irrelevant and wrong. The third line is the line of, of, of the two states. I've already talked about that. And the fourth is something, and I commend an article that came out in The Nation about a year or so ago by a guy named Ira Chernoff called The Myth of Israeli Vulnerability or Jewish Vulnerability. This is other myth. And of course, it underlies, the again, the negotiation process, which is all about, quote, Israeli security against this implacable enemy that has the ability to destroy Israel. Israel with a nuclear arsenal of 200 you know, warheads and the support of the biggest kid on the block. But anyway, the Palestinians can destroy Israel. So um, there's a myth about that. Israelis believe it. They do live in a state of existential terror, and their government uses it. So that's another myth, that Israel is vulnerable. Now, of course, we're all vulnerable. There's no safety in this world. 
things are becoming more and more uncertain. But if you want to feel safe, and if having, you know, being in a fortress surrounded by a powerful army makes you feel safe, go to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you happen to be one of the, you know, 30, 40,000 poor souls who live in Stayrote, which is a human shield which Israel has put together along its border with Gaza, populated mostly by Moroccan immigrants who are the you know what's of Israel. And they get to put up the flags and run to their shelters when the homemade bombs fly in from Gaza. Okay, that's the threat to Israel. It's not a threat to Israel. So the process that's going to bring peace to Israel and Palestine is not going to look like um, Northern Ireland, and it's probably not going to look like former Yugoslavia, and it's certainly not going to look like the peace process between Palestine, the Palestinian Authority and the PLO in Israel. It's going to bear very close resemblance in some very important ways that outweigh the differences going to bear a very close similarity to the uh, process that brought about an end to apartheid in South Africa and the movement that brought about an end to legalize racism to Jim Crow in this country. And what is similar about both of those? Both of those, the church has played an enormously important role. With South Africa, you know, when the church is 1980, well, I mean, the World Council of Churches has been working on this since the early 60s. And there are people in this room who are much more expert on the details of this than I am. But the basic story is just so compelling. In 1982, I think it was eight or nine black and colored use that word when you talk about South Africa still. It doesn't, it doesn't come out of an American, white American's mouth very easily. But they're basically, uh, black and colored pastors from uh, South Africa went to the uh, International Conference of the uh, World Alliance of Reformed Churches. It was in Ottawa, Canada in 1982. And they said, we're not going to sit with you at the Lord's Supper. We're not going to sit with you at the Lord's Supper because we can't do that at home. Our church at home is officially segregated. Whites and blacks don't take communion together. And that was a wake-up call to the church, and to its credit, it declared itself in status confessionis. It said, we cannot move forward as a church body as long as this threat to the most fundamental values and tenets of our faith exists. It did the Protestant uh, equivalent of excommunicating the, the, the white English-speaking uh, Dutch, Reform, uh, Dutch Reformed Church members in South Africa. And then um, the Belhar uh, Declaration came out, which declared apartheid a heresy. And, you know, apartheid was, that was one of the last few nails in the coffin of apartheid, in terms of the rest of the world, countries of the world coming in with the sanctions. The church was turned against the state. And it was huge. The project was gone by 1994. There's more to be said about that in terms of how united or not united the churches were about this, and I, I, I want to talk about that. But that's the South Africa story, kind of, kind of in a nutshell. The churches were working on it from the beginning. They were perhaps a bit late to the game. I don't know if it's fair to say that, but when they came in, it was huge. The civil rights movement, I don't have to tell you. Was born in the church. The leaders were pastors. It was a Christian movement, an unapologetically direct, self declared, confessional Christian movement. That's its spiritual and energetic center. It then spread ecumenically to the rest of the churches in the country, and then became interfaith, and there were, you know, there were half the half the Guys jumping on those freedom rider buses were Jews. <laughs> and um, and then it spread to the whole society, it became a you know a, a secular movement as well. 
civil rights movement was a Christian movement. And Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, articulated um, Christian gospel values. And if you read the letter from the Birmingham jail, that's what it's all about. The whole rationale for why we must act and why we must act now and why nonviolent direct action is the only way to go. It wasn't just a political strategy, although it was. It was, this is what the early Christians did. This is what Jesus wants us to do. This is what it means to be a Christian. That's why this is so powerful. Because this thing is going to get fixed, and it's only going to get fixed, by a global grassroots movement that says no to injustice. And that is not going to be and it's not going to come as a result of a political calculation. A political calculation is the call to unity, which is what the eight uh, white pastors and the one rabbi wrote to Martin Luther King Jr. sitting in the jail in Birmingham, to which the Birmingham letter was a response. And, he, and they said, Martin, we love your cause. <laughs> but it's hurting us. Don't do it this way. We're making progress. We got a new mayor in Birmingham. He's he's going to give you know he's going to give the Negroes more rights. The guy was a segregationist. There's no change that happens. Justice does not happen without structural change. Basic underlying structural change. That's what this is all about. And the the uh, the, the 1985 South Africa Kairos document which is called, not, not a challenge to Pretoria, but a challenge to the church, was a response to what the South Africa government was doing in 1985, which is what any government does when it's on the ropes, and the sanctions are starting to work, and the townships are exploding, and the armed militias of the outlawed political parties are ringing the country. They propose reforms. So we won't have blacks in our parliament. They'll get, what was it? I think Indians got two men to a vote and blacks got four to a vote or something. No. And we'll give you your own country, black homelands. We'll surround you. We'll control you. You'll be stuck there. You'll provide labor for the rest of the country. It was a two-state solution. And the churches said, no. We've gone along with you up to now. No. Politically, what you're saying makes perfect sense. In terms of justice, in terms of peace. And what did Martin Luther King say? A peace, uh, a, uh, peace which is the absence of justice. <laughs> As opposed to peace with justice, which means not so much peace. It's like what Jesus said. <laughs> you think I bring peace? No, I come to bring division. He didn't mean people should fight with each other. He meant that when you have peace, you're going to have conflict. Those people are going to line up on one side of the issue or another. You're going to draw the line. You're going to say, here I stand, and here's where everybody else is. And this is where we need to be. So that's what's going to bring peace, and it's not going to come from politicians. Ultimately, they'll make the peace. But to create the conditions for peace, where the sides have to come to the table and be ready to deal, well, that's up to the grassroots. And I would submit to you, it's up to the churches. And I would submit to you that, you know, the mainline churches are hemorrhaging members. Right? There's not there's not enough of a market for 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 pastors and ministers anymore. At least not in the main mainline. Why? Why do churches not seem relevant to people? Because what was it that Howard Thurman said? He said, um, he carried, this, is a, this is Jesus disinherited. Thurman challenged the Christianity of his time, which he characterized as sterile, muffled, confused, and vague. <laughs> unconnected to quote what the teachings of the life of Jesus have to say to those who stand at a moment in history with their backs against the wall. This is what Kairos is about. Kairos is a challenge 
It's a moment of grace and opportunity where God issues a challenge to decisive action. This is how the South Africans articulated it. So, that's why we need the church, and that's what's going to bring peace. How are we doing on time? Let me tell you a little bit about how I got here. <clears throat> and that'll get us into the theology, and that'll probably take us up to the end today, and then we'll be able to continue tomorrow. But I'll drop some breadcrumbs. <laughs> I was born in 1948 to a fairly traditional Jewish family, conservative, if you know how it works with the, with the Jews. We have Orthodox, which is sort of the more traditional, we have reform, not reformed, reform, um, and then we have conservatives in the middle, which we hold on to a lot of the traditional stuff, but, but uh, men and women can sit together, and, uh, et cetera. Anyway, so I was born into, into, um, into a fairly traditional family, got a very strong Jewish education. So and if you're a Jewish kid born in this country, into a strong Jewish community, as Philadelphia was and still is, you were raised, you know, this is three years after the war, this is right around the time of the establishment of the State of Israel. You were born into a, uh, a religion which is a very potent combination of rabbinic Judaism, mainline rabbin, you know, Judaism, and political Zionism. Mm -hmm. The two are not separate, mm -hmm. totally intertwined. Now mind you, this was not true before the war. Before the war, most of organized Judaism was officially either non-Zionist or anti-Zionist. Bad idea. Why would we want to do that? Why would we want to link our faith and our community with an ethnic nationalist you know, program? We want to be a faith community, like you Protestants. I mean, well, not exactly Catholics, you sort of have your own little state somewhere, but <laughs> we, you know, and that's what, you know, take a look at Reform Judaism, it's very churchy. It looks like, you know, sort of reform. Protestantism in mid 19th century Germany. Uh, but after the war, after the ovens, after the establishment of the state, there was a train. You kind of had to be on it. And if you weren't, and it's still true now, you're really kind of out, outside of the pale. And people have said that, Jews have said to me, you are outside of the pale. You're basically excommunicated. <laughs> You've got to pledge allegiance to the state of Israel. You've got to pray to the state of Israel. In most synagogues, Still, today, there are two flags on the pulpit. One's an American flag, the other's an Israeli flag. And so we pray to the state of Israel. It's in the liturgy since 1948. This is a prayer that was written by the rabbinate of the state of Israel. The state of Israel has a chief rabbinate. And they make laws. Um, and the, the, the prayer goes something like this, goes exactly like this. May God bless and protect the state of Israel. The state of Israel, not Zion, not Jerusalem, the state of Israel, the first flowering of our redemption. So, you know, the more liberal programs have gotten the explicit references to rebuilding the temple out, but that is still, Israel has replaced it. And, you know, I was taught that I had been blessed to be born in a time when my people had been redeemed from 2,000 years of suffering and slaughter. We were finally safe. We were saved. And this whole, the whole romance and narrative of the idea of the state of Israel, the whole, you know, Exodus, Leon Uris, and you know, Paul Newman, and all that, <laughs> really partakes of this narrative. Because, you know, we Jews are not, we're not really strong on creed and doctrine. You know, we don't have anything approaching systematic theology. It's a good thing. <laughs> but we have history. To be a Jew is to be grounded in Jewish history. If you ever been to a Passover Seder, you know, you know that that that's the, the remembrance of the exile, the, uh, the exodus from Egypt, and the liberation from slavery. It's the celebration of freedom. 
But here's how the liturgy goes, and I remember this because I've said it a million times as a kid. In every age, a tyrant rises up to annihilate us. That's the word. To make an end to us. In every age. And the Lord God saves us from their hands. And then you go through the whole thing. You start with Pharaoh, and then you go through the Middle Ages, you have the Spanish Inquisition, and the pogroms, and the Cossacks, and Hitler, and Nasser in Egypt when I was growing up, and now, you know, it's the Palestinians, and of course, Ahmadinejad in Iran, who I think maybe Netanyahu was not a religious man, but he worried, he would get up every morning and thank God for Netanyahu, for Ahmadinejad, because there's always an enemy out there. And it is a rationale now for Zionism and for the politics of the state of Israel. And when I was growing up, I was told that I had two enemies. There were the German people, because of what they did to us, and there were the Arabs, as we called them, because of what they would do to us if we didn't have Israel. I had these enemies. You had to have the enemies. And there is a sense of vulnerability and, and exceptionalism. Jewish exceptionalism has everything to do with feeling beleaguered and threatened, and frankly also superior. So Goyim, you know where Goyim are, They're not just dangerous. They're basically an ignorant drunken rabble that wants to kill them. And you know, I grew up in mid-century, mid-20th century, mid century America. I was not, to my knowledge, ever exposed to anti-Semitism. I grew up in a very liberal environment, and yet somehow, through my genes, I inherited my grandmother's <laughs> sensibility about the Goyim, and they were an ignorant, drunken, murderous rabble. They were dangerous. So you have to understand that about the, about the Jewish psyche and the Jewish sensibility. If you, if you want to start to get a sense about how crazy and destructive in that case, the organized Jewish establishment in this country is today. I'm not just talking about the, 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 the political lobby itself, but the advocacy organization, the philanthropic organizations, the Anti-Defamation League, which my father was a part of. We worked against black and white racism, and that was when they were, they were good guys then. Now, horrible. <laughs> Working against every value that they espouse in terms of human rights, and frankly, working against any possible future for the state of Israel and the policies that they're, that they're suggesting. And their attempt, so far, not so unsuccessful, to shut down anything which would threaten the unconditional flow of diplomatic and financial support to Israel in this country. That's what they do now. So, I mean, that, that's how I was raised. And that's how I saw things until I saw the occupation. Now, there was, how did I get to see the occupation? I could have been like most Jews, and frankly, most Christians, and make my devotional pilgrimage to the Holy Land, whether it was a Jewish version or a Christian version, and see the dead stones, and do the tourist route, which now, of course, also includes Yad Vashem and, and, and you know, the whole Holocaust industry, and not see what's really going on, or close your eyes to it. What got me? What got me there was that there was always something inside me that didn't want the identity that had been given to me. You know, there's a wonderful bright side to being Jewish. I treasure my tradition, I treasure that identity, I will always be a Jew, whatever that is. And those of you who were, some of you were at chapel this morning, you know, you heard me recite the Psalms and the Priest of Benediction in Hebrew. It's beautiful, it's wonderful. I can open up that book and I can read and stuff. Uh, but there's a dark side. And I've told you what the dark side is. And I think you as Christians can understand the dark side of feeling like you are the chosen people and you're better than everybody else and you know the grief and the horror that that brings. I didn't want that. And I especially didn't want to feel like a minority with where the rest of the world was dangerous and to be feared and, and basically reviled. So that's what ultimately got me to standing in front of that wall, a 28-foot high wall cutting through the middle of Jerusalem, which is where I first saw it. How many of you have seen that wall? Have actually been in its physical presence? Okay, so you know, I mean, as walls go, 
this is a this is a pretty horrific wall. People who've seen the Berlin Wall say that that's nothing compared to this. It's physical impact. So I stood in front of that wall, 58 years old or something. I call that middle age now. Notice how that keeps getting older. <laughs> and um, I had the, you know, predictable reaction to it, which is that this is. Well, I wasn't Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton stood in front of it and said, "No, oh, this is cool. Now I understand, you know, what we're doing." At least that's what she said when she was a senator from New York. And of course, if you, you know, according to Lenny Bruce, if you're from New York, you're Jewish. And certainly, if you're the senator from New York, you're Jewish. Um, but something else happened to me when I stood in front of that wall. Something turned over inside me that was profound and painful. Because I recognized that wall. That was a wall that I felt inside me that cut through my heart. It sounds dramatic, but it's true. That was a physical manifestation. That was the inevitable physical manifestation and result of that wall that I had been taught to believe I had to keep inside of me. It was inevitable that we'd have to build that wall. And at that moment, that's when I started to deconstruct it. The, inter the internal wall started to deconstruct it. I realized that my only hope, my salvation, was on the other side of that wall. I didn't quite know that at the time, but that's what happened. That summer was very weird for me because, you know, we I went with Interfaith Peace Builders, which at the time was a, uh, a project of the uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation. So, you know, we were um, our connection, our basic orientation was very, very, very liberal, progressive, nonviolent, Christian. Um, and uh, we were staying at the guest house of the St. George uh, Cathedral, which is the Anglican, uh, sort of seat of the Anglican church there. And uh, it's in East Jerusalem, you know, on the Arab side, on the other side where there used to be a wall. And, but I would stay at every night about a mile and a half west with my uncle and aunt in West Jerusalem in a fancy Jewish neighborhood, which before 1948, was a fancy Palestinian neighborhood. But now the Palestinians were driven out, and the Jews, well, only Jews live in this fancy neighborhood. And I love my aunt and uncle, and I stayed with them. And um, they sort of knew what I was up to, and that was okay, because they considered themselves liberal and progressive, and hopefully we'll have a little bit more time to talk about how I'm feeling about what it means to be a, quote, liberal and progressive Jew these days. Um, I think it'd be sort of like the Jewish equivalent of the people who wrote the letter to Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. We believe in it, but we, don't, we can't support your methods. Mm -hmm. And so I would walk every morning from my uncle and aunt's house in West Jerusalem, <coughs> east, into, into East Jerusalem, right along the old city walls. I mean, you know, if you know that area, it's a beautiful walk. It's gorgeous. And then at night I would walk back. I'd spend the day in East Jerusalem or whatever touring around we were doing with the Peace work we were doing, and then I'd go back to the West Jerusalem. Started to feel like I was at home in the East. I didn't want to be in West Jerusalem anymore. Mm -hmm. Where my family lived, where I knew the culture, where I spoke the language, where it was like, you know, it's down to my bones. This is where I'm supposed to belong. I didn't want to be there. I was too angry. I felt alienated. I wanted to be in East Jerusalem, not in the Occident, but in the Orient, in the souk where it's colorful and noisy and smelly and I don't understand the language and everybody's, nobody's Jewish. <laughs> I thought, what is happening to me? Am I supposed to convert or am I supposed to become an Arab? I mean, I'm not Jewish. I mean it, was kind of, it was a classic identity crisis. And it was painful. I mean, I, was, I felt pretty torn apart. I felt like I was looking into the face of evil when I was over there looking at the occupation. I didn't like the feelings I was having about my own people. Especially in Jerusalem, when we would encounter Hasidic Jews, you know, the black hats that, that are taking over the city, 
it sounds kind of anti-Semitic and racist, but I'm sorry, it's just the way I felt. I mean, I was having violent feelings. In fact, the joke was, again, I'm traveling with Fellowship of Reconciliation. Most of the Christians who were on this trip are like really, really like non-violent types. Really non-violent types. <laughs> they, most Quakers, you know, warmongers. <laughs> the joke was that they had to keep me from being non-violent because every time I saw an Orthodox joke, I felt that's what was happening to me. So one day, we're in the offices of Sabil. Sabil is, um, as I said before, is, this is the uh, uh, folks who are working for nonviolence based on the Gospels, and it was founded by an Anglican priest who was dispossessed in 1948 at the age of eight from his home in the gallery, Naim Atik. He's a brother now, he wrote a wonderful book. And we're listening. We have until 3 o'clock, right? Yes, you want to leave some time for questions. Yeah, I want to leave time for questions, so let me wrap this up. Um, so we're getting a lecture, we're getting the Seville talk. And uh, this is a woman named Nora Carmi, who is herself a dispossessed Jewish woman. She used to live in the neighborhood where my aunt and uncle live now. And um, she's talking about, you know, what it's like to be a Palestinian and the fact that her children are leaving because there's no future for them, and things are getting worse, and the world has forgotten them, and they're losing more land and more rights as the years go on. <coughs> and I said to her, Laura, you know, then we had questions, how do you cope? How do you continue on with the sense of having been so abandoned and the things getting worse despite all of your efforts? And I'll never forget what she said to me. She said, we follow Jesus, who was, he was a Palestinian Jew who lived under Roman occupation. He lived under a system where your faith in Torah, in a civil code, because there really wasn't any difference between religion and, and politics, where a civil code that basically determined how you related to your fellow human beings and to the land. And that <coughs> devotion to God and to the covenant meant equality, you know, jubilee. Nobody gets rich. And above all, compassion for <coughs> the most vulnerable, the widow, the orphan, the poor. And Rome said, no, you don't worship God anymore. You worship the emperor. You're ours. With tax and death, you're going to help Herod build this big, beautiful temple. It's classic empire defeating the beast. We're going to fragment your family and community, agrarian-based life. And if you don't agree with us, and if you revolt, there's the, there's the crucifix. You know, there's the cross. And Jesus saw this growing up. And he knew that armed rebellion was on the way. He said... Here's how you resist. You follow God. You stay with the Torah. Matthew 25. Look at me. Watch who I am. Watch what I do. That's the way to the Father, which is, by the way, what John 14, 6 means. It does not mean you have to be a Christian to go to heaven. It means mm -hmm. follow Jesus. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, interesting how the church got that exactly 180 degrees wrong. <laughs> anyway, she said, so that's what we teach. We resist by being Christians and following Jesus. She said, empires come and empires go. We follow Jesus, we're here. And that just, I mean, I can't describe what that meant to me because here's what it meant. It was the answer to my question of who I was and why I was feeling what I was feeling. On the way out, I picked up Naeem Atik's book it's called Justice, Only Justice, A Palestinian Theology of Liberation. You haven't read it, it's a thin book, get it. And he starts off talking about his own experience of dispossession, his decision to stay in the country and to continue to try to work for his people, his founding of Seville. And then he goes into the theology. He starts with the, with the prophets. You know, my prophets, the ones I was brought up on, Isaiah, Isaiah, Amos. And he says, what is their message? It's social justice. The widow, the poor, speaking truth to power. What's wrong with kings? And 
Then he goes right through to Jesus of Nazareth and he says, same message, same story. It's about social justice. That's our faith. Mm -hmm. Which is why when people talk about liberation theology, I say, why do you call it liberation theology? Isn't that like mm -hmm. theology? <laughs> <laughs> And I realized reading this book, and these were my prophets, except I wasn't allowed to go that last step to Jesus. Full stop. Very chronicles. You can't go to Matthew. Um, which is why I love the lectionary so much, because now I get to go the rest of the way. I realized that what I was feeling about the Palestinians, and frankly about my own people, was the most Jewish thing that I had ever felt. This is what I had been brought up to believe as a Jew. I was a good follower of Jesus. And Amos, I would say. And at working, devoting the rest of my life, I didn't know that was going to happen at the time, devoting the rest of my life to working for justice for the Palestinian people was the most Jewish thing that I could do. Now, it wasn't that neat, and it wasn't that quick, but this is how my identity crisis was solved and healed, I finally became whole. In a way that I had been looking for, I feel like, my whole life growing up as a Jew. There was always something wrong. There was something wrong with the synagogue. There was something wrong with my education. There was something wrong, fundamentally, with what had happened to Jewish identity over the centuries. And there was something wrong with the split between us and everybody else, certainly with the Christians. Now, what we'll talk about tomorrow is how this whole thing has gotten turned upside down since the war, and what's happened to Christian theology. Because we don't have time to go into it now. I will just say this. The game changer now is this Kairos Palestine document. It's, it's the current context of those who go to the Philippines, and go to Korea, I mean, they, in Asia especially, other occupied countries, they are developing liberation theologies, and they're amazing. But one, what's happening now is that liberation theology is coming into Europe and into the United States again through the Palestinians. And guess what? There is a frontal assault on it from the Jewish and the church establishments. And that's what we need, that's what we're going to need to deal with now. Because if there's one thing we learned from the South Africans, it's that it was that church was never unified. It was a church struggle. And that was a good thing. We need a church struggle. We need to take it on. It's easy for me to say this to you, you know, because I can be called an anti-Semite and I can shrug it off. Not so easy for you. But if you're going to take on this struggle, that's the name you're going to be called. And that's the question you need to pick up. And I look forward to talking with you more about it.
But I don't think that BDS is going to touch the money or it's going to bring Israel economic needs. I don't think we're going to see that when we start out. Oh, that's right. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I do agree with you. And I do think that BDS is probably one of the best things that we have um, for two reasons. Um, one is, BDS is not going to bring Israel to its knees economically like the sanctions brought South Africa. It's, it's a whole different, I think, economic scenario. South Africa was isolated to begin with. We didn't have that kind of investment. I mean, those $3 billion, they come back here to make their contracts. It's, and there was not a South African lobby. <laughs> But I think in terms, of, in terms of our own domestic politics, things like the Presbyterians and the Methodists uh, divesting, not from Israel, but from Caterpillar Corporation and Motorola and Hewlett Packard because they're involved in the occupation, is, has significant political meaning because the White House and elected representatives pay attention to that. And the more uh, denominations and the more powerful religious leaders, and I mean sort of evangelical Mega pastors too, and they're they're very very much in this game. Can do that. That will start to give our government the political backup that it needs. Okay. I mean, Obama's proving himself to be a politician. Big surprise. Okay. So if he's uh, going over there doing what he's doing with Israel today, if we changed the political calculus here, the president would act differently. That's one thing. The other thing is uh, direct political advocacy. So we are actually working now with Carlos USA on a project to do grassroots advocacy on a coordinated basis in the districts, coordinated between the denominations, and working, you know, working in a, in a coordinated fashion with secular and Jewish and Muslim institutions as well. But basically, doing it through the churches, through study of the Kairos documents, and through you know a, a good legislative advocacy um, uh, strategy. Uh, you should be aware of the fact that in October 5th, on October 5th in 2000, just last year, 15 major leaders of major denominations wrote a letter, an open letter to Congress. And it's, it's a game changer. It's a powerful letter. They have backed off. They haven't done anything about it. But that letter is there and it's ready to be used. And basically what it says is, we believe that the main reason that there is no peace, even though there's no violence on both sides, blah, 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 is our unconditional support for Israel and the money that's going there. And by the way, we think we are in violation of the Arms and Border Control Act and the, who was the other one? There's another major law that says that we, we can't just send money to countries that are in violation of human rights. And we think there needs to be an investigation of our aid to Israel. That would be huge to do that. But that's what we need to do. And I think the church is the, is the arena in which to do that. It's already organized. Could you speak to that in depth? Mm -hmm. Can you be more specific in your question? Uh, you had, uh, and I'm not I'm paraphrasing, something to the line of there is no liberation oh. of theology. So what I meant to say was that I think any, any real good theology is a liberation yeah. theology. Yeah. That's what I meant to say. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, if you take a look at the Gospels, it's liberation theology. Uh, basically, liberation theology says that uh, Christian liberation theology says that Jesus, on, that the poor, are Jesus on the cross, and that it is our, you know, to, to be faithful to Jesus and to be faithful to Jesus' message is to follow the Great Commission, to make disciples of the nations, which means to follow Matthew 25 and to work for the poor and to work for, for social justice. So that is what liberation theology says: it's the option for the poor, but that's the heart of the faith. Which is why, my question is, why call it liberation theology? Why don't you just call it Christianity? Does that answer your question? But does not theology get each individual can gain their own understanding of what that Say is? Say it louder, please. 
cannot theology be interpreted interpreted by different people who can interpret it one way and I yeah. can interpret it another way? Of course, so the other way to interpret it. To keep us uh, cognizant of those types of uh, topics? Well, I mean, the other, the, the other, a probably more common way that people think about um, theology, which I know it's kind of a misnomer. Theology is not the study of God. It's this, we, how can you study God? God is God. But theology is our attempt to understand what it is that God wants from us and what we're expected to do. Um, you can make a case that liberation theology, which is really all about um, discipleship in the world, is is different or sort of antithetical to not antithetical to but an alternative to the idea of an individual uh, relationship with God for personal salvation. And I think that that's a dynamic that is very very much in play. In uh, I think you heard about it earlier this week, didn't you? Did you uh, talking about piety versus Protest. prophecy? Right? So, I mean, I'm on the prophetic side of things, clearly. And I think that if you are going to have a profound individual experience of the divine, which I think is the only way in some sense you can have it, it has to be profound and individual, then you're going to be, uh, you're going to have to respond to the imperatives of your faith. And the imperative of your faith and of a personal relationship with God is that you are out in the world in that you're being a disciple. Um, thank you very much for coming back to Rochester. Um, in your book, Fatal Embrace, you mentioned Jews of conscience will have to go into exile because what is happening in Palestine and Israel is absolutely atrocious, which you know. I felt the same way. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that through this community of Rochester that we can take some of the Jews into exile and accept them and be with them because something, the, the world is changing. We know that the tides are flowing and um, you just can't keep going on in Palestine what's happening. And I'm sad it's the U.S. that's doing most of it. So, and I know the question there, so as a Jew, you're saying, you consider yourself a Jew in exile. This is a, this is a, a phrase that was developed by a Jewish theologian, liberation theologian named Mark Ellis. Um, and he said, we Jews need to, I, mean, I don't actually don't consider myself in exile. I don't like the idea of exile. It sounds like I'm out of it. I feel like I'm a member of a very, very important, wonderful, supportive community. Uh, so I don't consider myself in exile in any way. Um, I don't feel like I've lost my Jewish community. I feel like I've gained a, a, a larger one. Uh, you give me the opportunity to make, a, to make a point, which is that uh, I think that um, the small but growing minority of Jews who are um, opposed to Israel have realized that Zionism was a catastrophic and forgivable mistake understandable but catastrophic and forgivable mistake. Um, it's good that we're out here, um, but that you, that the Christians should not make the mistake of considering that this cause is part of a, uh, the, the interfaith project of reconciling with the Jewish people for anti-Semitism. Um, that is a um, manipulation that's being used for you. It's a powerful one. It's based on you accepting two basic, again, myths and lies, which are, one, that Zionism is Judaism, and that the Jewish people is the state of Israel. Now, that mostly is what most people accept. So that you cannot criticize Israel without criticizing the Jewish people without threatening our survival and our identity, which is all tied up with the state of Israel. And you cannot say that there's anything wrong with Zionism because Zionism is part and parcel of being a Jew. Now, I and many other Jews reject that completely. But the problem is that Christian Jewish relations, since World War II, since the Christian world woke up and said, what have we done? And it, 
been working so hard to rejigger your theology, get rid of the anti-Semitism and the anti-Judaism in it, is that you've swung way the other way. You've renounced basic tenets of Christianity, which say that the land doesn't belong to anybody, God does not live in a house, and everyone is chosen. Now, Zionism and the current sort of Philo-Judea Christian theology is uh, saying the opposite. It's saying, oh, the Jews are loved by God best. The original covenant is in force. There's a real estate clause in that covenant. We're okay with that. And we're going to ride in with you on a new Judeo-Christian clause. Okay? Reconciling with Christianity has a lot to answer for with respect to anti-Semitism. Okay? The Holocaust, the, the Nazi Holocaust, I don't say the Holocaust, the Nazi Holocaust, the genocide of the Jews of Europe, could not have happened without 2,000 years of a solid basis of anti Judaism in Western Europe. There's no question about it. Okay? So Jewish Christian reconciliation has to go on has to continue. It's a good thing. Anti-Semitism still exists. It has to be. You have to be vigilant about it as you would against any form of racism. That's over here. Over here is one of the most egregious human rights situations in our world today. As Americans and as Christians, you're up to our ears in complicity about it. And Christians and Americans, as Christians and as Americans, have to do something about it. The tragedy of the situation is that in the current discourse, you go over here and you say, I'm going to do this, and you use the P word, and you talk about Palestinians, you're going to be accused of betraying this project over here. Mm. They are different, they are separate. Mm -hmm. But most people are not going to agree with you. Mm -hmm. That's why I say, if you're going to take on this project, and you're not willing to pick up that cross and be called the worst name you can be called, find another rights, human rights cause. Because that's what's going to happen to you. You have to say, you have to understand this is not an interfaith project. This is about the church and the church getting its own house in order. We are not here, we Jews are not here to bless this project. You don't need us. You don't need our permission. One last question. Mark, can I ask a question? Why do you think that the Palestinian um, issue has become so symbolic um, globally? You know, um, I mean, for instance, in South Africa, even now post-apartheid, where we supposedly have got our freedom, um, trade unions still today, when they take to the streets, will say, we are not free until Palestine is free. So that's still a contemporary slogan when the, when the trade unions go onto the streets, indicating that, they're, that they still are not made whole, healed, saved until Palestine is liberated. Why do you think, why do you think the Palestinian issue holds such a symbolic... Yeah. value and potency in so many global issues. I mean, what, what is it about that struggle? It's a, it's a, it's a really good question, Debs, and I'll try to answer it quickly because we're, we're basically out of time. First of all, with respect to South Africa in particular, you know, I asked South Africans that same question when I was there two years ago. I said, why little Palestine? I mean, what are you doing? You see what's going on here. It's worse. You know, apartheid is gone, but in some ways, you know, but the racism and the economic inequalities and the sexual violence and everything else are worse. You've got so much to do. So I got two answers initially. One was, well, the Palestinians were here for us. Arafat came and supported us, and so we have to stand with them. The other one was, we understand apartheid, so we can't stand by. Those are good answers, but it wasn't the real answer. The real answer was, we need this cause. Since we quote, one, in 1994, we have, as a church and as activists, we've totally lost our prophetic footing. We don't know who we are anymore, and we're lost. This will help us get back on our feet so that we can do something here in South Africa. And by God, that's what happened. That's exactly what happened. They welcomed the Palestinians in 2011. I was there with them. It was amazing. They wrote a nice piece saying, we're with you. They helped the Palestinians write their document. I mean, it was a very, and continues to be a very important relationship. But within two years, they wrote their real Kairos document, which is a, a word to the ANC in these times. Okay? And it's really strong. And it said, you know what? Just because you're a, you're a black brothers and sisters does not mean that you are completely out of line. And as Christians, we oppose you. 
and we will bring you down like we brought down to clerk, and it's working, and it's making a difference. So that's South Africa, and I think it is a beautiful, perfect example. I think it can be true for the African American church here as well, which is having its own issues in terms of prosperity theology and pietism, mm -hmm. and losing their young people, and you know, where's the African American church? What happened to black theology? Mm -hmm. yeah. So African Americans, clergy and others, and I know many, go over there, they see what's happening, it challenges their exodus, the exodus theology. You know, yeah. There are two things going on with the African American community. And I can start to speak to this because I've been working on this for just a couple of years anyway. <laughs> One is, there is that, that creates a conflict here and why it's so important for African Americans to get over there. One is, the African American community feels a real sense of, uh, of loyalty and gratitude to the Jewish community for our solidarity during the Civil Rights Movement. You know, there's that iconic picture of Abraham Joshua Heschel linking arms with Ralph Abernathy, Martin Luther King, and Ralph Bunch and marching from Selma to Birmingham. And that was real. Um, that's one. The other is theological. You know, Exodus theology. Think, think about the, you know, think, think about the, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're crossing over Jordan. We're liberated, we're being liberated from slavery. And so, and, and so are the Jewish people. And so they're our brothers and sisters. They understand. And that's true. We did understand. And we will understand again, and that alliance can be can be reestablished. But I'm not interested in the American Jewish African American alliance anymore. I'm interested in the Palestinian Christian and the African American Christian alliance, and the Palestinian in general. It doesn't even matter if they're Christian or Muslim. Uh, what I've heard from African Americans is this can be a re this is a redemptive cause for the African American church. Their words, not mine. This is a redemptive cause. We need this cause. And for Americans in general, I mean, think about it. Think about the narrative that most Americans are fed about the Palestinians. Okay? And I hear this from congressmen and representatives, and I hear it from people in general, and I hear it from, from clergy. Well, they're Democrat. They're Democratic like us, meaning they're sort of white and Judeo-Christian like us, right? And they are protecting us from those dark, dangerous, violent people with this dark, dangerous, scary, <laughs> hateful religion, and they worship this other god called Allah, right? And they hate our freedom. So this is the presum this is the dominant American narrative of the clash of civilizations. Yeah? Oh, sorry. This is the dominant American narrative of the clash of civilizations. Right? And so Americans go over there. You know, Christians go over there. Devotional pilgrimage. Walk where Jesus walked. And if, if we do our work right, and this is one of the things that we have to do, is to make sure that how many of tens of thousands of Christians go over there every year, what are they going to see? Who are they going to work with over there? And they meet, just, just have some exposure to what's really going on, and they meet some real Palestinians. They meet Palestinians. And they see that they are who they are, which is wonderful, friendly, patient to a fault, angry, bitter, but not hateful, or not hating. It's amazing. And they say, well, wait a minute, this is not true. <coughs> if these people are not those dirty, crazy Islamic, Islamic militarist, fundamentalist Muslims, whatever they were calling them, if it's not true of the Palestinians, maybe it's not true of all these other people, these others around the world. Maybe what we have been taught and what, what we believe as Americans is not true. That, I think, is why it's potentially so important and it's an opportunity. Well, friends, to be continued. Thank you, Mark. tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock yeah. when the Stanley I. Stuber lectures continue. And out this door is the bookstore. And please don't forget to fill out your evaluations. It's very helpful to those of us who have been planning. Thank you.
Yeah, I didn't know how full it was going to be or I would have uh, <laughs> blocked in the seat.